again and welcome to Riviera Apostolic Church in Riviera, Texas. It's good to be in the house of the Lord again. Thank all of you for being here this morning. And all of you who are listening to us out there on the internet, thank you for tuning in and listening to us today. Sometimes I wonder how lucky, how, how lucky I am and how I got so lucky that I get to spend so much time in the house of the Lord. I get to be here every day and not just on Sunday and Wednesdays. But I have something for you today that I believe that the Lord gave me. And so if you'll remain standing, turn with me to the book of 2 Kings in your Bibles, chapter 3, and verses 15 through 18. It says, But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not see wind, and neither shall ye see rain. Yet the valley shall be filled with water that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. For he will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. And so I want to talk to you this morning for just a little bit on the subject I'm just digging ditches. Lord, anoint my words this morning as I bring you to the congregation. Lord, let encouragement, let strength and comfort. Oh, yes, Jesus. Let revelation, my Lord, come into the hearts of those that hear your word this morning. God, anoint me, my Lord, for I am inadequate. But with your help, I am made strong. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Everybody said amen, and you may be seated. Thank you for standing. I want to talk to you today for just a little while about a concept contained in this chapter that the Lord has laid upon my heart. And hopefully, by the end of this sermon, you will be encouraged and strengthened by what God has given me. I spent some time yesterday in prayer about what to say. And I believe that God has spoken to my heart and laid it on my heart to bring to you this. And so I want to go through the third chapter of 2 Kings with each and every one of you. This third chapter in the, in the book of 2 Kings is so interesting historically and so pertinent to our lives spiritually. So please forgive me this morning, or this afternoon, if I read to you and orate this account in the Bible just a little bit differently than what you most usually would read it when you just read it in passing. You see, in the ancient days when kings led their soldiers and their warriors into battle, it was much different than it is today. Today we push a button on a computer. We drop bombs from miles away. And we send drones to spy on and destroy the enemy. 
And it is becoming more and more of a world where soldiers are remotely fighting the wars and not actually needing to be so much on the battlefield. I know that it is still bloody, and I know that sometimes that is necessary. And I know that it is gruesome and many lives are lost, but the tactics are ever-changing. But in biblical days, the kings of that time would march their men on foot to the site of the battle. They took everything with them that they would need to sustain them, sometimes for years at a time. They took cattle, sheep, horses, honey, dried foods and liquids that they could add water to, and yes, they sometimes took a little water to help them for a few days, but the water was so heavy that they had to rely on water sources that they could scout and gather along the way. Many, many a battle was lost because they couldn't find water and their provisions ran out and the aggressors starved or turned back for a lack of most usually a lack of water. They would lay siege to a town or a kingdom and oftentimes whoever had the most access to water and food would win the war. It was a brutal, merciless, and shockingly grotesque affair as they would lay siege to a city and those people in that city would not be able to leave, and as their provisions ran out, they would begin to starve to death. And before it was over with, they were too weak to fight, and the aggressors would come in and wipe them out. Mm -hmm. And so it was, as we began to recount and examine this event in chapter 3 of the book of Second Kings, and it begins with these words. Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and he reigned for 12 years. And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father Ahab, and not like his mother Jezebel. For he put away the image of Baal that his father Ahab had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin, so he departed not therefrom. Now we need to understand at this point in this story that it was not Israel's finest hour. They were backslidden, if you will, and they were not in favor with God so much so that they were friendly with the Moabites and worshipped false gods and had strayed from the ways of their forefathers before them. So Ahab and Jezebel were leading Israel down a path that was steadily kindling the wrath of God and he would soon render consequences for this series of disobedience and apostasy. So as time goes on, Ahab and Jezebel have now died. And verse 4 says, And Misha, the king of Moab, was a sheep master, and rendered unto the king of Israel an hundred thousand lambs and an hundred thousand rams with wool. But it came to pass, when Ahab was dead, that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel, who was now Jehoram, Ahab's son. The king Jehoram, the king of Israel, went out to Samaria at the same time and numbered all of Israel. He counted them. Now Israel at that time was about three times the size of Moab 
And so I'm sure this took quite some time. But when he had finished, he decided that he needed some help with his plan. So verse 7 says, And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, Misha, the king of Moab, he's rebelled against me. And will you go with me against Moab to battle? In other words, I want to put him in his place. He's, he's really, he's crossed the Rubicon, as they say. He's rung a bell that can't be unrung. I want to spank him properly, and I want to take him down a peg or two. The reply was, and he said, I will go up. I am as thou art. My people are as thy people, and my horses are as thy horses. And he said, which way shall we go? How do you want to do this? And he answered, the way through the wilderness of Edom. Verse 9 says, So Jehoram the king of Israel went, and Jehoshaphat the king of Judah, and the king of Edom. And they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. So when they got to Edom, and the king of Edom joined up with them, they went through the wilderness of Edom around to the backside of Moab. And so after a seven day trek through the wilderness of Edom, they evidently had not found water for themselves and for their livestock. The cattle were starting to drop from lack of water and the horses were weak. And the men were thirsty and no doubt beginning to grumble and complain. Because you can go without food for a while, but your body will shut down from a lack of water after just a few days. True. So verse 10 says, Jehoram the king of Israel said, Alas, alas that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Isn't this strange? how all of a sudden it's God's fault. Here they are not following in God's ways, not giving Him honor or praise and worshiping idols and false gods. But now they're in a predicament and suddenly, oh, now it's God's fault. God has called us, told us to go into battle against these guys, and now... He's going to abandon us and forsake us and let us die at the hands of our enemies. Those people that we were friends with, now they're our enemies and God has called us to fight them, but now he's not going to help us. But Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord? that we may inquire of the Lord by him? This was the same question that he had asked a couple of chapters beforehand. And now he's asking this again. You see, he's one of those men that he only inquires of God in the time of need. And let me just say something to you today. When you have to rely on someone else to pray to God or to talk to God to get his attention for you, and you cannot go to him for yourself, you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the way you've lost the path. Right. Something somewhere has been lost. I understand you can call for the elders of the church when you have a need or when you're sick. But that needs to be coupled with a prayer life of your own. You need to have some prayer deposits laid up in heaven for yourself. Don't just ask for prayer only when you need something or when there's a catastrophic event that has taken place 
in your life. I was at a conference some years ago and I overheard a minister telling a young lady as I walked past and he said, if you really want to get your prayers answered, what you need to do is find a little child that is about 7 to 10 years old that's just received the Holy Ghost and have them pray your prayer for you because there's no boundaries between them and God. No. And I had to stop and say, that's a bunch of baloney. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've never heard such junk coming from the mouth of a minister in my entire life. Right. When we as the children of God cannot reach God because of the boundaries and the barriers in our lives, we need to get back down on our yes. knees yes. and get in touch with God and renew our Holy Ghost Yes. So that we have no barriers between us and Jesus Christ. That's right. Since when do we have to ask someone else to go to God for us? We are His children. Since when do we not have the spiritual fortitude and aptitude to come boldly? before the throne of God as His Word has told us to. I don't understand sometimes how people can expect that they can just cause someone to do something that's out of line with God. And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And verse 12 says, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, said, The word of the Lord is with him. So Jehoram, the king of Israel, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, went down to him. And Elisha said unto Jehoram, the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father Ahab, and to the prophets of thy mother Jezebel. And Jehoram, the king of Israel, said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together, to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely if it were not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, and I would not see thee. I like his attitude. Here he is speaking to a king and saying, who do you think you are asking me to go to God for you? You're nothing to me, king. And if it wasn't for this man from Judah, I would not even look at you or talk to you. In other words, you're a backslidden reprobate and you don't care about God. You just want him to help you in your time of distress and your mom and dad were no good either. <laughs> what a spiritual boldness Elisha had. Thank God for a few good men these days who will stand up and say it like it is in a world of political correctness in confusion and godlessness and perverse ideology. Right. Who professing themselves to be wise have become fools. And so he now says in 15, but now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord 
came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water. <laughs> that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. And this is but a light thing in the sight of, of the Lord. This is nothing from my God. For he will deliver the Moabites also into your hand, and ye shall smite every fenced city, every choice city, and ye shall fell every good tree and stop all the wells of water, and you will mar every good piece of land with stones. So that night, evidently, <laughs> all of the warriors and the soldiers of Israel and Judah and Edom were digging ditches. <laughs> evidently, they were up and they were digging ditches all night that night. All night long they dug those ditches and God didn't say how many to dig. He didn't say how deep to make them or how wide that they should be. He just said fill this valley full of ditches. So I can just picture in my mind all those men those great warriors that had trained and had their armor on and their swords and they were ready to fight the battle they had grown weak from lack of water. I can just picture them out there starting to dig ditches in the valley. As the night grew dark and the wolves began to howl and the crickets are chirping, the coyotes are yipping and the owls are hooting. The time when they usually slept and rested from a long day's march, here they are out there and they're digging. Mm -hmm. And they're digging hour after hour after hour and they're digging and they're still digging and they're digging some more weariness is setting in but they still dig their muscles are tired and aching but they keep digging to their credit now they are obeying God and the task that he has given them. And as they trudge on exhausted, every joint screaming for relief, every muscle burning from dehydration, they keep on digging. To the west of them are the Edomites, strong, full of energy. They have plenty of food and water, but this is their homeland. Their wells are full of clean, cold, fresh water. And now the kings of Israel, Judah, and Edom, who rule a mass of land that is approximately eight times larger than Moab, now they are waning. Now it looks like maybe the Moabites can win this battle. Now it seems that the time has come for the tides to turn against these three kings in favor of this nation of Moab. The three kings now with a long trek to the east and the enemy to their west, strange lands to their south and water to the north. They are in a bad spot if something doesn't change them and change soon. Right. And so verse 20 says, and it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered, that behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. <laughs> and when all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight them, they gathered all their people that were able to put on armor 
and upward and stood on the border. They were ready. They said, these guys have traveled. Their horses are slow. Their cattle, their heads are drooping. These guys are dehydrated and parched. And so that morning they came to fight. And as they looked to the east, where the three kings and their armies had gathered, I can tell you that that morning it was a beautiful morning. Because it was a red sunrise. No clouds in sight. And these men, these warriors, they can see for miles. Mm -hmm. All except for the fact that there's the sun rising and it's in their eyes. And as they looked over to the east, behold, they saw the ground in what appeared to be covered with puddles of blood. Right. They don't know that there are ditches. It looks like the flat land as it always has and now it looks like there's huge puddles of blood covering the valley. And I know this because of what the next few verses say. Verse 22 says, And they rose up early in the morning, and the sun shone across the water. And the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. And they said, This is blood. The kings are surely slain. They must, they must be dead. And they have fought and killed one another. Now therefore, Moab, to the spoils. Let's go. Something has happened. These guys have lost their mind due to a lack of water. And a great cry of laughter and triumphant expectation goes forth. Because the spoils of war are now going to be even sweeter because they didn't have to fight for them. Everyone's dead. As much blood as there is on the ground down there, they're all gone. In their haste and in their greed, they do not even notice there's no body laying around. <laughs> they just rush headlong into the camp to claim the spoils of war. But verse 24 says, And when they came to the camp, of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. But they went forward smiting the Moabites even in their own country. And they beat down the cities and on every good piece of land cast every man his stone and filled it. And they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees. Only in Kerhasareth, they left the stones thereof. Albeit the slingers went about and smote that also. And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even unto the king of Edom. But they could not. The last verse says, and then he took his eldest son that he should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. I want to say to you today don't ever stop digging your ditches right you don't know how many ditches God wants you don't know how deep or how wide he wants you to dig them all you know is that you need to fill your valleys with ditches when your children are backslidden, keep on digging. When the doctors have given you a prognosis and it's grim and you see no way out of it, 
Keep on digging. When your job is lost and you can't pay your bills, keep digging. When you see no hope in your life, keep on digging. When the storms are all around you and the night is long and it is dark, keep on digging. There are no instructions on how many ditches you need, how many ditches you have to have. There's no blueprint that tells you how to put them down there and how wide and how deep and which way they need to go. You just have to keep on digging. Don't ever stop digging until you see them filled with the promises of God. Just keep on digging. When you seem tired in the battle that you've been fighting seems lost, you're worn and you're weary, you keep on digging. Because sooner or later, God will look down upon you and He will take you into His arms. And He will say, okay, my child, that's enough ditches. Now you can stop digging because now I'm going to fill the ditches with your promise. Right. Your battle is over and I will fight it for you. Just stand still and see the